This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we got the latest installment of From the Senate with Mark Wayne Mullen. So he's a United States senator representing the great state of Oklahoma. He's going to come on here about once a month to talk about stuff that is going on in the world today. We're going to be talking about really all the stuff going on in the air, you know, in the atmosphere. So the Chinese uh, balloon, the spy balloon, and then all the other things that have been shot down, all the rumors of UFOs and UAPs and these different things. But then also these other things that seem to be happening. There's these uh, train derailments that are happening all over the country. These trains just so happen to be carrying these chemicals. Uh, there's these, these fires that are happening all over the place. There was another one that I saw right before we started this interview today. So it's kind of like, hey, what in the world is going on? And so he gives us a little bit of an idea as to kind of what, what the actual data say and what the actual, I don't know what the real word is that in terms of what's going on. But then he also gives me a couple of theories as to what he thinks is happening, what he thinks China is doing. And then we get into what happened last week, which is him endorsing Donald Trump's run for the presidential election for 2024 to represent the Republican Party. So he came out very, very early. This was before Nikki Haley even got in the race. And he came out in support of Donald Trump. And so I asked him about that. It's like, hey, it's this early. You know, Donald Trump's kind of this wounded candidate. You know, the 15, uh, 2015, 2016 shine is no longer there. So so why come out and support him? And so we got his answer there. But also, one thing before we get into that, this is the last time I'm going to be able to talk to you guys before we actually do this raffle. Just reminding you guys that we have a knife raffle. We are giving away one of these custom-made Blaine and Sean Stevenson knives. Blaine and Sean Stevenson, that's the, the father and son from Stevenson Knives. They made this custom knife specifically for the Undaunted Life audience. What we are going to do is we're raising money. We're doing a raffle of this knife to raise money for Undaunted Life, but also the idea for this giveaway really morphed to where we didn't want to just support Undaunted Life. We also wanted to support the local pregnancy resource center here in my my town of Edmond, Oklahoma, and that is the Hope Pregnancy Center. So guys, every single dollar that is donated or you know through this raffle, 50% of that is going to go to support Undaunted Life. The other 50% is going to go directly to saving the lives of babies from potentially being murdered in the womb. The Hope Pregnancy Center, they give women money. They help them find rent. That They minister to them directly and try to lead them to Christ. And they also do that with the men that get those women pregnant. You know, the fathers of these children. They, they make sure they have cribs and diapers and everything. And so your money is going to go directly to the support of that. So here, we need to talk a little bit about this knife, though. So this is their Florida Hunter. So in Normally retails for around around three hundred dollars, and I got to get this right this time. The steel is not five two one zero zero ball bearing steel. I've been informed that it is fifty two one hundred ball bearing steel. Remember when I uh, we did the first episode of the year when we talk about you know revel in the opportunities to look like an idiot? Well, I kind of had a feeling that I was saying it wrong, but it's not five, five two one zero zero. It's fifty two one hundred ball bearing steel. That handle right there, that is their crazy fiber scales handle. There's this beautiful, beautiful handmade leather sheath. You know, I have got you know a couple of other of their knives, and this is the best sheath that I've seen from these guys. It is an absolutely, absolutely gorgeous knife. And here I'm going to tell you how to enter, and then we'll get you into the interview. So any person that donates $20 through the Undaunted Life donation website between now and February the 23rd. That's one week from today. And puts the word knife, very important, put the word knife in the comment section, will automatically have their name entered into the randomized drawing for the Stevenson Florida Hunter Knife. So that's every 20 bucks, okay? Every 20 bucks equals one spot in the raffle. So if you donate 100 bucks, you get your name in there five times. If you donate 1,000 bucks, you get your name in the randomizer 50 times, so on and so forth. And also, if you are a current monthly donor, regardless of how long or how much you've been donating to Undaunted Life, I'm going to go ahead and put your name in the randomizer or twice as a thank you. But obviously, if you guys want to put in another donation over the top of that, go ahead and do so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to likely record a video the morning of the February 23rd. I'll put the drawing on Instagram and all that, and I'll put it here on this episode, and then I'll announce the, the winner that way. But again, the donation link is in the show notes, or you guys can just go to undaunted.life backslash donate, undaunted.life backslash donate. Do not forget to put the word knife in the comment section. Otherwise, I don't know that you're entering into this raffle. But guys, I just wanted to say one last time, thank you very much to Sean and Blaine Stevenson from Stevenson Knives for doing this. It's time to blow it out, guys. We would love the support support from you guys and also help us support the Pregnancy Resource Center. But guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Mark Wayne Mullen, welcome back to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Sorry I'm dressed so formal, but I'm, I literally just walked off the Senate floor. So How I'm dare so you dress like somebody who pretends to know what they're doing inside of that chamber? Come on now. Like the next time I see, I want to see that cutoff shirt that you wear when you're, you know, out in East Oklahoma in the middle of August. That's what I want to see next time. It's not cut off. It's a wife beater, you know, with a little yeah. bit of, with a little bit of coffee stain on it. And, I'm just uh, saying, I want to see all those bad tribal tobacco. tattoos. Yeah, yes. I want to see all the bad tribals that you got back in college. But uh, I know we always like to kick this off in a, in a pretty uh, low-key way. But I just got to say, like, in preparation for this interview, there's some things that I'm kind of worried about. And there are some things that the country is really worried about. And we're worried about them because there's a lot of confusion and seemingly a, mo- a lot of misdirection. And so it all started with a little stinking balloon up in the air over Montana. And then we, we just kind of let it go all the way across the country and then shoot it, you know, off the East coast. And then we see all these reports of other things over the weekend, these unidentified, uh, flying objects or, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena that are being shot down. And now they're being shot down with a lot of regularity. And then we have the train derailment in Ohio and then the controlled burn. And then we have, you know, there's a, a truck that overturned with chemicals in Arizona and another one in Texas, And there's all this weird stuff happening all at once. And the people that love this stuff, Mark Wayne, all the conspiracy people, all those extreme people, they're loving this right now because they're like, hey, we're distracted by the Super Bowl. We're distracted by Sam Smith. We're distracted by balloons up in the sky. But I I know you've been briefed on some things, and obviously you can't tell us everything, and there's certain senators on certain committees that have gotten even more briefings. But can you just tell us what in the world is going on? Well, I, I would, I'd be willing to say that, um, and by the way, my Wi-Fi is just sketchy as it can be, and I apologize about that. Um, I want to see if we can do something different here in a second. Government but, uh, can't do anything right, including Wi-Fi. That's okay. We'll, we'll give you a pass on this one. Yeah, it's it's pretty rough. But so um, I, I, you know, I sit on Senate Armed Services, and uh, our briefings are pretty high. I've set in uh, probably a classified briefing on this every day. Uh, that we've uh, that we've had uh, an issue going on, uh, except on the weekends. Uh, we have we have been constantly being um, briefed on this. So the balloons, uh, most of the stuff with the, with the I'll tell you my theory on the balloons. Okay, um, it, this isn't classified. This is my theory. So I'm not sharing any information because honestly, sometimes the way our classified briefings go, you can turn on Fox and CNN, watch both of them. And you'll figure out a little bit of the truth and then you watch CNBC and you'll figure out the lies. Um, and so it, it's one of those things that you really have to um, have to dissect yourself when there's trying when they're trying to give you the the facts. They're very vague. Uh, one thing we do know for a fact is that the the uh, Chinese balloon wasn't a mistake. One thing we know for a fact is it wasn't drifting. It was being it was being um, uh, directed on where to go. That's not that we know for a fact. We know it had information to be able to look at and send that information back to uh, China. We were able to block that. We knew it was sending a signal. We have the ability to block them from being able to send it back. Uh, we know that it had um, a, a, a thermal seeking device on it, where it could pick up thermal imaging, uh, and so uh, it was a it was a, a, a balloon that we were used to seeing. This isn't something that was that was un, unknown to us. We we've seen them uh, send these same type of balloons out. And, uh, and so what, the, what it was looking for is we don't know. They allowed it to travel across the, um, uh, across the, the lower 48 because, according to them, they, um, uh, they didn't want to shoot it down for risk of harm because they didn't feel like it was going to harm anybody. The thing is, is that it came across Alaska. Mm-hmm. Um, it had, they had plenty of time to shoot it down there. It came through Canada. Uh, very sparse areas, which is very unlikely for it to cause any any type of structural or harm. Um, by the time it gets to the East Coast, yeah, you probably can't shoot it down. You know, yeah. Montana, yeah, pretty pretty low population. You know, yeah. uh, just going through the Dakotas, very low population. Uh, you probably find some areas to shoot the thing down. I mean, your debris, your debris. Um, 
estimated debris trail would be roughly two miles. You can find two miles of, of areas that you're, you're not going to have any houses, right? So you could have chose to do that. We couldn't figure out why they let it go through. Um, it, it, but we ultimately decided to shoot it down in uh, Atlanta or on the Atlantic coast. I mean, in the Atlantic ocean and uh, East coast. And, um, and it was in fairly shallow water, water. I mean, it was around, you know, average depth around 45 feet deep. And so we're recovering it. The thing is, was these other balloons connected to it. Uh, they're having all types of speculation to it. And my, this is where I get into speculation. We mm -hmm. don't know if those balloons were connected to it. Uh, we haven't received any of that information yet. We're still in the recovery f phase of recovering the three uh, much, much, much smaller balloons. Uh, that we shot down and when i say much smaller they weren't uh, flying at the same altitude the big blank uh, the big balloon was high, was flying at a very high altitude the smaller balloons were flying at a much lower altitude and um and they, let's just i use this for a reference of size i'm not referencing the size i'm just saying for a reference of size right so let's say the the big balloon was as uh big as a, a as a uh, as a football field the small balloons would be the size of a um, of maybe two large RVs, hmm. so much difference in, in size wise. So here's what my theory is on this: um, the number one threat that we have to the United States is China, hands down. It's not Russia, uh, it's not North Korea, it's not Iran, it's not Afghanistan, it's not even ISIS or Al, Al Qaeda anymore. It's China. And they know that. They know that they're number one adversaries, and they feel that same way about us. An advantage that we have over China is that we can be energy independent when we don't have a, a person in the White House that is trying to take away that advantage. Right. So what we don't have an advantage of is population base. Right. They have a much larger population. That means they have a lot more people to throw out if we break into a war. Um geographically, we have an advantage. We're much harder to get to than they are, that we don't have the same neighbors that they have. There's not as many areas to go into. Um, uh, but what they, and they have a, they have the real rare, rare earth, earth minerals that we actually need to make these batteries that this administration is wanting to push us to. But in a time of war, what you have to have is you got to have a, a strong energy supply. Uh, you see it in every war, every country. They don't have that. They have stockpiles, but they don't have an abundance of energy. So if we were to go to war, they would have to learn how to disrupt that. And, uh, and the biggest way to disrupt that is take out a, a major supply that, would, that wouldn't readily be easy to reroute or put back online. And that's our pipelines coming out of Alaska. Uh, they provide a tremendous amount of petroleum products um, to the rest of the United States. And, uh, and if they were to disrupt that, they could take out at any given time, 20% of our supply. Uh, mm. you, I mean, that's huge. That's a huge hit. The reason why we are still buying oil from, from Russia is because we haven't been able to replace that. We could replace it ourselves, but because of the administration's rules and what they've done, they, they know that, 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 we can't replace that yet. However, in a time of war, I would imagine all those spigots would be turned back on. And so they're going to have to take out a, a strategic supply of petroleum products and, and remove it from the market and cause almost a panic and, and that'll hurt our supply chain. So why, why is that important? So if you, if you look at the, the way the balloon flight path was and understanding that they're controlling it, understand that there's a, there's, um, a Wi-Fi signal off of it, understand that there is a, a thermal seeking on it, um, understand that it came across Alaska uh, made an, uh, and uh, Canada, made an abrupt turn, headed straight uh, down to the lower 48, and then it just kind of drifted across uh, if you look at it, it's very similar to a pipeline, a major pipeline we have. And, uh, and you go, well, you can get a map of the pipeline. Yes, you can get a map of the pipeline. But maps are not always accurate. But if you are in the middle of winter, which we are, and then you have a petroleum product that creates heat that's going through tundra and frozen ground, it's very easy to get up thermal sensing. 
and you can map it very, very, very easy. And then also all the valves are controlled by Wi-Fi. So if you're able to know where the signals are and you're able to grab something off of it, you can disrupt that supply chain, not necessarily by having to blow it up because that would cause big issues, mm -hmm. but by just attacking the, the valves, knowing where those valves are. And so I think they were mapping out uh, for future purposes our, 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 our best way to disrupt us and take uh, somewhere around 20% of the supply chain of petroleum products going to our refineries down in a, in a second and then constantly cause that a disruption. It's not like you're just going to build a build, a secondary pipeline <coughs> and get that to us. You know, if they disrupt a, 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 a pipeline out of coming out of North Dakota, we're putting it on rail, we're putting it on truck and we're still bringing it down. Right. Uh, you don't have that option coming out of Alaska. And I think the other balloons, the other objects were also doing roughly the same thing, except they were moving at a much, much lower rate and a different rate. And they were more adrift at a lower altitude. So that's what my theory is behind it. That is not, um, that is not something I received in briefing. It's just, I, I've been on the energy commerce, energy and commerce committee for a long time. And then I was also on Intel and one of my, things I looked at on Intel, uh, I was over the energy sector and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's been a point of vulnerability for us. And so when I saw that and I saw the balloon, that was immediately where my head went. I thought, hmm, that's what they're doing. Yeah, I think uh, even looking at it from our side, it was like, oh, okay. it started out being funny, like, oh, it's a balloon. And then it was like, wait, they're not going to take care of this thing. And they just floated all the way across. Yeah. And then obviously, you know this, and we've seen this a lot since COVID, the distrust for government and for any of our, you know, uh, people that are in charge has really gotten to an incredibly low level. And, you know, that obviously you've been in Congress for a little bit. And so that that really has kind of tinged the way that we're seeing that situation. I have well, more questions there, but we or go ahead. Well, let me let me just throw this. This is a different type of policy, too. There is no way the Biden administration would ever shut that down if the public uh, outcry to shoot it down wouldn't have been so great. Hmm. There's no way they would ever brought it down. Why? Uh, the difference between Obama and Trump and Trump and Biden, Obama was a pleaser, right? Appease the person, don't rock the boat, right. bow down to them. Oh, tell them how good they are. You know, be nice. Trump was screw that peace through strength. Um, we don't, we, you shouldn't fear us, but you should respect us. And if you disrespect us, then we're going to slap you across the face. Uh, Biden has brought in the appeasement policies back, yeah, and uh, and and China and all of our ever, other adversaries know this darn good and well. I mean, let's just look at Afghanistan. Uh, when in Afghanistan, uh, Al Qaeda decided to to uh, attack us after Trump got in office. Trump's response was, is he dropped the largest bomb called Moab, the mother of all bombs, that's made out of uh, made in McAllister, Oklahoma. He dropped it on them, which was the largest bomb since World War II, just to prove a point, yeah. to say, I'm not joking, don't mess with me. Uh, when you had, uh, when you had um, uh, Russia assist uh, in Syria um, using uh, biological warfare on, uh, in a, in, uh, through 50-gallon drums and taking out a whole bunch of Kurds, you had uh, you had you had uh, immediately, which by the way, at that time Russia controlled the airspace of, over over Syria. You had Trumps go, hmm, okay, well here's what's going to happen, and he gave him a heads up as we were headed to the airspace or the airfield to which they took off from and bombed it and uh, totally flattened that airport. That was his response. Those are two responses that he did within the first six months that he was in office, and everything went quiet. Yeah. North Korea went quiet. They were no longer shooting ballistic missiles into the Pacific. Um, you, you, China wasn't being a threat to us. Russia had shut down their rhetoric. And, uh, and those same tests have been put on Biden. And uh, they realize real quick, this is the new Obama administration, but they, they, they even lean harder into appeasement.
when people will, will they'll kind of cackle at peace through strength, but then when you see peace through strength work, then they try right. to make it, oh, it's it's this or it's that. But certainly uh, you don't get peace through not strength. Like that's not something yes. that, that really happens. But right. you bring up Trump there. And so obviously last week you made some news because you came out and you endorsed Donald Trump as a Republican representative to go into the presidential election for 2024. Now at the time, he was the only Republican that had declared for the race. As of right now, as we're sitting here recording this, Nikki Haley is the other. So there are two people. People, right. But we assume that a lot more people are going to get in. We can assume that maybe a Rubio or a Ted Cruz or a Tim Scott, certainly a Governor DeSantis. A lot of people are wanting him to get in. So I guess I understand why you did it, because this is a guy that endorsed you and helps you win your race. And obviously there's 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 loyalty there, but also you believe that he's the best pick. My question, I guess, is well, outside of just why did you endorse him is why did you endorse him before we got to see any of the other candidates? Because what we do know for certain is that he's already lost to Biden once, and this was before January 6th. And think what you want mm-hmm. to think about January 6th, but the a, a good portion of the American populace, the, the, the voting bloc in America, thinks that that is at least somewhat his responsibility. So he already lost to a dead guy that didn't even campaign once, and now I don't know that we have any of that shine left over from 2015, 2016. He's kind of a known entity, so it seemed a little little early, even though I understand the endorsement, but I just want to kind of get a sense of where you're at in brain space sure. with it. So two things. Uh, one, I consider uh, uh, President Trump a, a friend, not mm-hmm. not just um, a, a presidential candidate that was the president of the United States that politically helped me. <clears throat> when my son got hurt, which many of us, you know, we talked about right. when he got hurt in, in, in the dramatic brain injury wrestling three years ago, um, Trump took a very special interest. I mean, he came to he came to Bakersfield, California, saw my son, talked talked to him almost weekly. Uh, would always call and visit with us. He he offered to give us any assistance, even financial assistance, which we, we didn't need that. We didn't take it, but he offered to do everything for us. And I still don't talk to him this day without him wanting to know, hey, how's my boy doing? Uh, and so we developed a friendship. So it's a little bit further than that. Right. But let's talk politics behind this thing. Uh, we're going to be in a very dangerous spot, uh, even more so than we are uh, than we are today. And in, in two years from now, we're going to very, be in a very, very different position. Uh, if we're not already in a conflict with China, it's going to be bubbling. And the economy, who knows what it's going to be like? Um, who knows what the stock market is going to be like? Who knows what's happening with a with you know with the workforce? Who knows what's happening with um, uh, with supply chains? Uh, who knows what's happening with energy? and the cost of it at the time. But I know it's not going to get better. Mm-hmm. And and I'm not I'm not willing to wait two more years for someone else to figure out the job. We know that Trump's policies worked. Uh, we you can say what you want about his rhetoric, but we know that it worked. We know that it, it was effective. We know that he put America first. No one can doubt that he loved this country. No one can say that. Um, you may not like his behavior, but you can't question his love for this country and the sacrifice that he's made. Most presidents go to president go the, into the presidency and get rich when they leave. He's lost a fortune because of his desire to serve this country. Um, no one can can debate the respect he had around the world with world leaders, and and the military, the guys and gals that's going to be defending all of us loved him. And, and you, it's important for them to love uh, their leader and trust their leader and know that he's got their back if they're going to lay down their lives for us and we're going to ask them to do uh, suicidal things. Uh, and, and so I want a known, proven leader. And so I didn't have to sit there and look and say who else should come in the field because that's who I want there. Um, and Nikki Haley, I'm not saying anything bad about her. That's great. Uh, I don't know how she gets there. Uh, Trump's base isn't leaving him. Trump's base, which is the Republican Party, he's never dropped below, I think, 52 percent with the Republican Party. And they have thrown everything they can possibly throw at this guy. I mean, they've Mm -hmm. thrown the book at him. So where's the path for other people to get there? You're not going to go through him because you're not going to chop him down. You're not going to tear him down. They've already done everything to him. So where are you going to go around him? What's the edge? So let's say his lowest point's 52%. That means 48% of the population is still, with the Republican Party, primary voters, right? It's still, eh, where are we going to go? 
Well, that 48%, they don't know that they're going to go with Nikki Haley. They don't know if they're going to go with DeSantis. They don't know if they're going to go with Rubio. They don't know if they're going to go to Cruz. But I know they don't. not one person has all 48%. Sure. So that narrow window to go around, what lane are you going to get in and drive? That's the thing about a primary. You got to find your base. You got to find that lane that you own. And Trump already owns that. So another reason why we decided to go ahead and go out there too is say, let's start closing the door here. Um, let's make sure that that we pick off one state at a time and say, okay, we're going to take Oklahoma off the market. It's not at play, right? You're, Nikki, you're not going to get you'd be anybody here. Right. And then I really think it makes it hard for people like DeSantis to get in the race, talking politics to you again. If you get in and you challenge Trump <coughs> and you're not successful, which I don't believe they will be, um, then it's almost runt your ability to run for office down the road. Because the only way you're going to be able to go around him also is you got to try tearing him down. So you got to attack him. And that means when you attack him, his base is not going to come back to you. They're not going to forget that. So DeSantis, even you take someone like DeSantis, DeSantis has to make a really tough decision. Do I go ahead and run? DeSantis is pretty young. Hmm. Do I go ahead and run? Or why don't I just wait six years? Because in four years when he's, or in two years when he's elected in office, he's lame duck immediately. So it's going to be an open primary in, 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 at the end of his term. So DeSantis would be better off then, in my opinion, is to stop and wait. He's got two more years after the election. So he's got four years. He just won re-election as governor. He's got, so after the presidential election, he's got two years, <coughs> excuse me, he's got two years left to be governor, and then he's going to come out of office. Well, that's perfect time because that's right after the midterm election, and he's going to have two years to campaign for presidency. So if I'm Ron, uh, that's what I'm looking at. I'm being a little bit more strategic looking at this moving forward. So with that in mind, I know you got about 60 seconds before you need to roll. Do you think if somebody does create the lane for themselves where they're able to go around Trump and they get the nomination for the Republican uh, Party for the 2024 presidential election, do you think Trump will get in line with the rest of the party and try to send his support to that person's base? Oh, I don't. I, I, I can't answer that for him. I think it depends. There's a lot of stuff that that goes into. I would think he's he's loyal to he's loyal to to the um, to the American people and if the American people make that decision. I know he's not going to, I know he's not going to want Biden or uh, who I think why should be the Democrat nominee is going to be Hakeem. I think Hakeem Jeffries mm -hmm. is going to be the Democrat nominee. I don't think there's any chance in the world Biden runs and uh, Harris will want to run, but she is disliked more than him. And I think Hakeem Jeffries, the, the leader of the Democrat or the Democrat party in the house now, I think he is their nominee. I think they're thinking he's the next Obama. Well, that would certainly be interesting. I know there's been a lot of names that have been floated out there. We don't really know what that's going to look like. It's going to be a long couple of years. But as always, we just really appreciate your time. Mark Wayne Mullen, thank you for coming back on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with Mark Wayne Mullen. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got the link to our donation page again, guys, undaunted.life backslash donate. Every $20 that you donate and you put the word knife in the bottom, you will be entered into our raffle. And you got one week left, so only one week left, guys. I've also got a link to the Stevenson Knives website and then a link to Mark Wayne Mullen's website as well. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>